stark, volcanic and barren. This was a strange place for the ten national parks of New Zealand to have their beginning. A hundred years ago, Mount Tongariro was a region held in awe by the Maori tribes living round it. And they dreaded its violation almost as much as its legendary wrath and its brooding physical presence. Fear that his people would inevitably have to sell their sacred land to Europeans persuaded the paramount chief, Tehoho, to give Tongariro and the two active volcanoes near it to the crown in 1887 and so preserve it as a gift forever from me and my people. In this first national park on the slopes of Ruapehu, the gift is used by 330,000 people every year, up to 6,000 some weekends making it the most intensively used area within the parks. More than 40 ski clubs have their own lodges on the mud. Throughout the national parks, rangers are always glad to help people towards a greater appreciation of their park's particular attractions. Of course, this Iruwera National Park is some of the finest native bush in the North Island. There are plenty of birds around, though people get the impression they're scarce, uh, just because they're not sharp enough to spot them. But they're there, all right. And uh, some, of course, uh, you'll never see because they're nocturnal. Still, we may be lucky. Ah, there's a toy. Each park has a visitor centre, focus of help and information. Altogether, there are uh, ten parks, uh, three in the North Island and seven in the South, uh, covering more than five million acres. Rangers and staff also work in the more remote places, repairing or making new tracks through bush and often difficult terrain. The whole purpose of national parks is to hold the delicate balance of protecting the land while giving people the freest possible use of it. In opening up such country, there's always the risk of destroying the natural beauties of the land forever. And this has made New Zealanders increasingly determined to protect it, both now and for the future. <coughs> for most people, the parks mean the chance to relax. Nelson Lakes is a family park. The able Tasman coast for sailing and the chance to get right away from the cares of the city and everyday life. Abel Tasman Park, with its beaches and islands, has only one road in. But launchers can cruise along its coast and up quiet inlets like the Falls River. Critics of the national parks claim they're unspoiled because so much of them is hard to get to anyway. But those who find such places Hope it'll always be that way. For the others, there are pleasant and easily accessible campsites and plenty of carefree holiday spots by lakes, mountains and beaches. The 
motor camp at Waikara Moana is another popular place. The launch Rua Pani takes visitors out on this beautiful North Island lake. Around it are the bush-covered ranges of the Urawera's, which have changed little since the Maoris first came to them. And although their settlement has dwindled to centre mainly on Rua Tahuna, their way of life is closely woven with the history of the whole of the Urawera National Park, making it, like Tongariro, one in which the past is still very real. This land was once their stronghold against other tribes and against the Europeans in battles little more than a hundred years ago. And the great forests that protected them then give them their living now, on land they still own near the boundaries of the park. The dense rainforest of Westland, silent, moss-deadened, unchanging. From sea level, this park rises to more than 11,000 feet. Its great glaciers, the Fox and the Franz Josef, attract thousands of overseas visitors and tourists. Nowhere else are there rivers of ice like these, moving down at a rate of five feet a day to finally melt away well below the bushland. Along the main divide of the Southern Alps, the park meets Mount Cook National Park with its mountains and glaciers and the Hermitage, probably the best known of the several first-class hotels in or near the parks. From both the Hermitage and Westland, scenic flights take tourists and sightseers who may never have stood on snow before to high snow fields and the heads of the glaciers. Where Ruapehu is every man's playground, the vast ice fields of the Southern Alps and the 18 miles of the Tasman Glacier give those who've flown up here long exhilarating runs over snows devoid of footprints or the marks of other skis. Mount Cook has rare flowers like the mountain lily and certain areas of the parks have been set aside for scientific research and study, with great care being taken to preserve both the flora and fauna in their natural state. Because of its isolation, much of the plant life on Mount Egmont is unique as well. Like Tongariro, it was a sacred mountain to the Maori, but it was the threatened destruction of the forests on its slopes by early settlers that led to its creation as the country's second national park. Today, these great outcrops of igneous rock and lava flows are of special interest to geologists who believe Mount Egmont may have been active as recently as 300 years ago. And it's been possible, by careful study, to get some clues on its past and its likely future by dating the dark ash layers in the lonely swamp on its flank. A few such places desolate to many people's minds, have been set aside as completely protected wilderness areas. Some on high snow or lonely islands, like these in Fiordland, almost inaccessible.
Fiordland is the largest of the parks, remote, a vast region of mountains, rivers, bush and lakes. Tracks and outlying huts have been put in, but the high country and three million acres of rainforest are for the greater part in their natural state. Country for trampers, hunters and climbers. Rain feeds the forest. feeds the streams and grows on its way to the numerous lakes. Fiordland is one of the world's largest national parks. A great ice age gouged out its now peaceful lakes among the forests and mountains, and man uses their waters to reach places once inaccessible. The townships of Manapuri and Tayanao are just outside the boundary of the park. Teyana, the starting point for most tourists and overseas visitors, who may have come to tramp the world-famous Milford Track, hunt or fish for trout, things worth coming halfway round the world for. to Milford Sound runs most of the way through dramatic country. Sound, with its almost vertical cliffs, is typical of the deeply indented Fiordland coast. <laughs> School children get the chance to gain an appreciation of the national parks at Rotoiti Youth Lodge in Nilsson Lakes, on courses under park rangers and resident teachers. The lodge was built by community effort and gives many children their first real concern for their environment. First of all, we start off at the ground level. Bird that lives on the ground round a beech tree. Be feeding on the ground round the beech tree. Jenny? Bush robin. Bush robins, yes. And what type of food is it feeding on? Insects. <laughs> From the practical side of the course, the children are introduced to the pleasures of tramping and bushcraft, and more rugged sports which may follow. On Mount Temple and other peaks in Arthur's Pass National Park, for example, is first-class rock climbing. And on these mountains, and right down through the high country of the Southern Alps, roam chamois and deer. 
not native to New Zealand, but introduced from overseas, and a threat to the flora of the national parks. Today, the national parks cover a thirteenth of the whole country. In all their variety, they're the heritage of everyone who's heard the call and felt the freedom of the unspoilt land. 